Okay, welcome everybody. Sorry for the short delay. Uh, let me turn the volume down a bit. So that should become better. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, so we're continuing today with the uh, section, second lecture dealing with um, hash function. What we did last Wednesday. Hello, the billigen Plätze. Hello. Very good. Um, what we did last week, we introduced the requirements for hash functions. There was this constructive approach where we first defined what we would like to have and what are possible attacks are, and we derived requirements from that. And then uh, we spent quite a few um, minutes on the dealing with collisions and the birthday paradox. What I want to do today is, first I want to kind of wrap that up, what we did last week. So I want to talk a little bit more on hash function, particularly on collision attacks and the birthday paradox. The main part of the lecture is devoted, in fact, by introducing a new algorithm, which might be the last time in this whole course where we actually need learn about a new cipher, a new algorithm. And that's SHA-1, which is the most important hash function out there in the wild world. Okay? So, but first we start with here. And it's More on hash functions. Okay. So recall what we did last week. Um, collisions were defined such that find x1, comma x2. such that h of x1 is equal to h of x2. And if you want to visualize that, you know, makes it a little bit more intuitive what we have. We have a hash function here, you know, which has some kind of compression-ish property. We get two outputs out, namely the hash value of x1, and then x2, of course, also gives us an output. And we call that a collision if these, let's say, 160 bits, that's a typical output size, if these 160 bits are identical. That's called a collision. And then we talked at great length on um, last Wednesday on uh, what is the complexity, how hard it is, and that was the birthday paradox. If we have n bits here. Efforts or complexity for finding a collision there was this formula, this firm, famous formula we have this is kind of what we expect, you know, if we have, if you have an 80-bit output, we expect the complexity is roughly 2 to the 80 or 2 to the 81. But this is not true. That was the big thing, the, the, the big thing of last week, the big conclusion of 90 minutes of, you know, boring lecturing was this is not 2 to the n plus 1, but this is 2 to the n plus 1. What's missing here in the exponent? Uh, Say. This is two. That's what we spent 90 minutes on. I'm exaggerating that what we spent 35 minutes on. Everybody with me here? This is the square root, right? We, we, we compute the square root that came out of this derivation. plus a little bit of constant factor, plus 
natural logar logarithm of 1, 1 minus lambda, okay, where this lambda was likelihood of a collision. Recall, I mean, you can have really bad luck. You could try many, 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 many different inputs, and you might not get a collision, but so we, we talk about probabilities here. So, are we ready? What I want to show you is just one table from the book. That's where, that's where we are. Just wait one more second here. It's just reformatting the PDF. Just bear with me. Four, three, two, one, yeah. Okay. Okay, so sorry for the delay. This is what I wanted to show you. This is kind of an. What's that? Good for you. That's maybe the best for you. So I just want to have a little bit of an intelligence about this formula uh, of this table here. So this is plugging in values in this formula. Yeah. N is a bit size, right? Output size and lambda is the likelihood. The big lesson learned, for instance, if you have a 160 bit hash function, which is a popular size, in order to find a collision with the likelihood 50%, lambda equals 2.5, we need about 2 to the 81 messages and not 2 to the 160. Okay, so you have the bit length. Um, what is kind of interesting and maybe a little counterintuitive, nicht eingänglich, was man so rät, is if you want to have a much higher likelihood, we don't need much more messages here. Okay? So even a 90% likelihood of a collision, we get away with 2 to the 82. That means this lambda is not really all that important. Um, yeah, so th th that, that's a uh, um, big thing. And uh, what we want to have, for instance, if you want to have if you, there's a very typical scenario nowadays. You have some kind of complex protocol, like in your web browser, and you use AES. And what, what, is the small, what is the minimum bit length for AES? 128, right? So AES, has, we say, has a strength or a security level of 128. That's called a security level. Now, as part of the protocol, at some point, you also need a hash function. And you're using a hash function. If you want, and now of course it makes sense to have a hash function with the same security level, the same strength, what you see if you use a 160-bit hash function, which is very common nowadays, you get a hash function which is easier to break than AES, which is not a nice situation. You know, first you hash and then you do AES stuff, and now you see 
hash function becomes the weakest link here. If you want to have a, so what kind of output do you need? What size hash functions do you need to get a, to get a 128 bit strength here? What do we need? What do we need? 256, exactly, right? So if you want to have a hash function which is as strong as AES, you have to go in this column, right? In diese Spalte, right? And you, you see, you know, you get, with a 256 hash function output, you get a, about a cryptographic strength of 128. Cryptographic strength means that's the effort to find a collision, okay? So that's the essence of last week. What is left to do What is left to do is, this was all, you know, not very concrete in, in engineering terms. In particular, what we do not know is how do we build a hash function, okay? Is this, again, this was only talking about requirements and the only thing we discussed just now in a uh, uh, um, large part of, of last week's lecture was what is the minimum output length? We haven't said anything how to build these babies, okay? And that, that's the main part of today. And I want to give you a little bit an, a diagram, a classification perhaps, how to build hash functions. There have been many, 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 many not that many, but many, many, many proposals out there for hash functions. Roughly speaking, the two big families, the one thing you can do, you can take a block cipher and construct, can we leise sein? Hallo. You can take a block cipher and build a hash function with that. How? This is in the book. We're not doing that here. It's, it's actually very, very easy. You look in the book, it takes you about 13 minutes to understand how that works. What is probably more, not probably, what is much more common in practice is the other big approach in a fancy term, for a fa fancy term, fancy Ausdruck, is a so-called dedicated hash fang function. Again, it's very fancy, sehr schick. What this really means, this is a hash function that is constructed to be a hash function, unlike a block cipher. In a block cipher, you can do many things, in particular encryption. You can also do hash functions with that. Very often in practice, people use very specific functions that were con constructed, built to be a hash function, right? So, um, and there have been dozens of proposals over the years, over the last 20 years or so, the most important one is the so-called MD4 family of hash functions. And here we have um, MD5. There was actually an MD4 which was broken more or less directly and has not been used widely. MD5 has been used. SHA-1 and SHA-2. Secondly, there is a new algorithm coming up which is called SHA-3. And here are many other, many others, okay. So I want to talk for one or two minutes about that. So this is what's being used. This is in your web browser and in, in you know, virtually all internet type of application. MD5 is dead. That was broken. Okay. 
major, major work with Professor Dobartin, who was the first crypto professor here in Bochum. He started with me in 2001. He's world famous for breaking MD5. Shawan is shaky. Okay, so there are attacks are on the no, no, not attack on attacks on the horizon. There are attacks out there. Okay, but there are. It's still pretty hard, hard to find a collision, but this is going to die soon. Okay, we have the problem. There are hundreds of millions of implementations running with SHA-1. Again, all web browsers in the world use SHA-1. Okay, that's what we're going to talk about. That SHA-2 is a continuation of that. Okay, it's out there, and this seems very secure. Um, on um, table 11.2, I think maybe on the next page. Let's see where we have that. Boop, boop, boop. Yeah. So you see an overview about this, uh, uh, the MD4 family. The most important parameter for now is this, this column here, the output bit column here. That's what I mean. Yeah. Okay. You say MD5 was 128-bit function, and as you can see here, collision found, yes. Collision found, yes, means it's dead. Don't use it. Okay. Um, SHA-1 has 160 bits, so normally you would think has a collision resistance of 2 to the 80, the problem is, and this is pretty new stuff about three years ago, people find mathematical ways of finding a collision more efficiently, which about 2 to the 63. And people have been trying to, to, to find such a collision. There's a worldwide effort going on, um, coordinated by people at uh, TU Graz in Austria. Uh, they haven't found it yet. Okay? If you want to contribute, you can log in and download some software and help them with collision, collision search. It's a big thing. So this is probably going to happen in the next two years or something like that. Then we have SHA-2, and you see SHA-2 is a whole bunch of algorithms with different outputs, output lengths, 224 bits, 256, 384, 512. Okay. So and this is, and they're standardized, and of course now many new products replace SHA-1 with SHA-2. This is good. SHA-3, I'm going to talk about that later, okay? So what, what, what we are going to do here is... Which is a little bit funny that we discuss an algorithm that's half dead. Um, why do we do that? Because it's super widely used, which is maybe not a great argument. But what is a, a really good argument is SHA-2 looks pretty similar to SHA-1. So once you under, understood SHA-1, which you're going to do next Tuesday night when you do your homework, um, then it's pretty easy to understand SHA-2. Okay, it's just a, a slight generalization. There. The difference is that big. So we're already done with a first Capitulation, the first chapter of today, and now we, the last two uh, chapters are devoted to the SHA-1 function, and uh, we talk with, an, I call that introduction to SHA-1, and then we look in the bloody details. Maybe I call it overview. Overview of SHA-1. So if you If you look on SHA-1 from a, you know, from, abscess, from a satellite, you know, satellite picture on SHA-1, you can't see the details. What you see is this here. You see an algorithm.
with an arbitrary input x, you know, x can be one sentence, can be a credit card number, the input. It can be that PDF file, which is, I don't know, three megabyte or so. It can be, can be your hard disk. So arbitrary long input, like all hash functions, 160-bit output. That's the key parameter. So the question is, um, you know, how do we do the, in, the internals of this? Okay. So the next picture, I need almost half a page for that. If you want to copy that, and if you do at the end of the page, you may flip the page over. But it's completely up to you. There's no requirement. And you don't have to copy anything, because every, almost everything is in the book that I'm doing here. So um, the internals, do, do, do you remember with block ciphers, with block ciphers, there are all kind of different ways of building block cipher, but one possible construction is the, is the Feistel network, and that's similar to hash functions. One possible construction is, is very specific and very popular, and this is being used. SHA-1 uses what is called a Merkel. Ralph Merkel, he's one of the, the you know, we always say this, Diffie and Hellman, Whitfield, Diffie, and Martin Hellman, they invented public key cryptography. <coughs> this is not really true. There was Hel Diffie, Hellman, and Ralph Merkel, and this is also the guy who did important work with hash functions. So this is the Merkel Darmgard construction. How, how, how is your Danish? Danish, you know, Germans have the strange letters with the dots, right? The umlaut, eh? you've seen them, right? So <laughs> Danish do the same, but weirder. So there's a little circle on the A. Will not be on the exam, don't worry. So, um, so what is the merkel damgard construction is very easy. What you do is you take your x And of course, this is, this is the whole idea. This is the whole problem. We typically not hashing only a credit card number consisting of 32 characters or something like that, but something pretty long consisting of n blocks. What you do, first you do some kind of padding. And then you have this main part of the algorithm, which is called the compression function. That's the compression function. And you, yeah, in 15 seconds, you have to watch what I'm doing here on the board. 13, 14, 15 times up, so you have to look. So what happens? You feed x1 in here, the compression function, you get some kind of output. Now you take this, here's a switch, you take this output, and you feed that back into the compression function together with x2. Okay, so you take x2 and the previous output, you compress that again, you get the second output. Second output is fed back, Together with x3, it's going in again. Okay, it's not that complicated. Um, this is the output. This is then h of x. And by the way, the book and the lecture notes, and I'm not terribly consistent with that, and I'm sorry for that. Um, we use uppercase h, gross h, for the output in today. So, and the merkel darmgard construction is what I'm... Putting in dots here, this box, this is Merkel Darmgard construction. Okay. Um, we're not going to talk, we're not talking about padding. This is kind of a very practical detail, and I'm not going to do that. 
it's not very complicated. Read it in the book. It's, it's probably instructive to, to read how, how padding works in the real world. What is important for SHA-1 are now the bit length. One bit length, what is, what is the bit length? I'm, I'm talking about these lines here, right? They represent buses, computer buses. Which bit lengths do we know already from this here? Which bit lengths do I know? Any ideas? There are one, two, three, four bit lengths. Which one do I know definitely? The output, very good here. This is 160. It means also this is 160 here. Yeah. And in particular this, this is made, so this is 160. What you do not know is that the, um, the block size x1, x2 up to xn has 512 bits. That means you feed rather large chunks of messages in your hash function. So you feed 512 bits, which is 64 characters, right? Yeah. So 64 bytes. You feed into your hash function, they're processed. The question is, again, so this is, you know, a ver very kind of stupid, laughingly easy view was this here. It's just a block with input output. Now, one level one more detail, one detailierungsgrad, right? A little bit more detail, one level down in, 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 in terms of detail, more fine grain. We have this view, which is, you know, has this really nice name, merkel darmgard construction, which is what you see here, this iterated thing. And the big thing left, what, what, what do you think, what is the big, big thing we're spending the next 55 minutes on? Compression function, right? So, I mean, Ralph Elsa, if you implement that stuff, if you look at the security, the construction is, I mean, a lot of, you know, intelligence went into coming up with this construction. You can prove certain properties. In order to actually build that or actually implement that from an engineering point is how does the compression function work? And I could give you, and it looks really complicated. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll scare you. Okay, ich mache Ihnen schon mal Angst. Is that okay? Okay, are you scared? I hope, right? So it's, this is really, in order to take you this anxiety, okay, don't look on this anymore. <laughs> take that away. One, what should I show you? Uh, yeah, let's stay here. Okay, this is the same what you have. I want to give you kind of, guide you how to understand it so that this construction makes a little sense. I'm going to show you the picture again, don't you worry. But I want to, you know, by the hand nehmen and kind of develop how, in particular, how this really wild picture that I just showed you, you know, which should scare you, how this is based on stuff we did in the past. Okay. So we have an intermed. So what I did, um, you may want to skip one page ahead because this is, I want to draw stuff here next to it. Okay. You know, what, what I really want to do is, want to give you, you know, zoom in with a magnifier glass, with a loop. I want to look into that. Before I do that, I want to relate to something we did earlier. We did six months ago. I want to uh, talk about block ciphers a little bit again. Recall. Block ciphers. Block ciphers shared a major property with, uh, with this merkel darmgard construction. They were also iterative. You know, they consisted of rounds, and this is what we're doing here.
And we're not talking about AS or DES or anything in particular, but on a very high level, block ciphers work as follow. You have round, let's say, zero. Then you have round one, and so forth. up to round, I don't know, S minus 1. It doesn't matter how you call, which, which variable name you're using here. This is one thing. And then what you also had, and here your message M or X was going in. And don't call that X. Call that M for now. It's not pretty here what I'm doing. <coughs> okay. So this is a round function. So the input to every round function of AS and DES and triple DES and blah, 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 all the block ciphers that are out there was always the message or the input from the previous round. And what is the other input? What was coming from the side? The key, right. And what really happens, you know, we started with a key, which is, let's say, 128 bits in the case of AS. But you didn't feed in the key directly. You fed in, we're feeding in what's called a subkey, right? Unterschlüssel. And this was derived by this box, which is called the key schedule. Schlüsselfahrplan in German, which is not a very nice word. You wouldn't, well, it's a nice word, but it doesn't make that much sense. You wouldn't call that a far plan in German, but this is a um, poor translation. So what you get out is subkeys, right? You get K0 out, you get K1 out, and so forth. And the last round gets, you know, in our notation, gets subkey K sub S minus 1. Again, this is what we did in November, which is almost exactly six months ago, seven months ago. Now, SHA-1 looks somewhat similar on, a, on an abstract level like this, namely, if we introduce names, um, if we feed in You know, at a given iteration, that means we're feeding in um, block number xi. Does anyone? We're feeding in at this point the previous output, which has which index? What do you think? Hi or hi minus 1? What will I hear? Minus 1, right? A minus 1. Okay. That's what I'm looking at. Leave some space, you know, go all the way to the, red, to the right, um, right hand edge of your paper, of your page. So here we have round zero. Round one, up to, and now comes the first new information, piece of information. Compression function is how many rounds. Does anyone recall how many rounds do we have in AES? If you have the, the standard AES with 128 bits, how many <coughs> rounds do we have? 10, very good. Here you have 80 rounds. So if you start you know, counting with round zero, that would be round 79. Your input is, is this here is h sub i minus 1. Uh, 
And now comes this big, big difference in thinking, kind of a new a switching of roles or something. Remember, a, a, a major part what we have to do, we go in with 512 bytes with, did I say, 64 characters, 64 bytes here, and we only get Twenty characters out. So this is, you know, some kind of compression takes place. That means we, if the normal thing, the, the normal analogy would be, you know, we feed in x here. But the problem is, if you go in with 512 bits here, you end up with 512 bits. You won't have a compression. So what we do, we treat the um, message, the long message, the 512 bits. We consider this somewhat somewhat like a key schedule here. That means the message is being fed in here and something else is being fed in here. So we, the message is not being put in here. This is block cipher. The message is fit, fed in at this point, which we call the, not the key schedule, but the message schedule. So here you feed in your xi, your 512 bits. So what you do, you know, here we took the original key and derived subkeys, and this is what we're doing here. We take the original message and derive you know, something like sub-messages. They, they, we use the variable name w cross v. So we start with W0, in round two becomes the variable W1, and so forth. And the last round, surprise, surprise, W index 79. So we're almost done. What is also now very different from block cipher, and block cipher is here, we're essentially done here. What this does is we, oh yeah, no, what, what we have to do here with the block cipher, you were done here. You, you know, this was your output. What we want to do here, we want to have some kind of feedback. So what you do at the end, you do some kind of addition, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, what kind of addition this is. This is this funny symbol here. Essentially, it's essentially an integer addition without carry. And you do I forget what I said about with this feeding back. No, this is something different. It's just for security reasons. You take your original input, you do a feed forward to the output, and you add the again this 160 bits, you add the on those. 160 bits, and I'm going to show you all the details how to do that. Um, maybe one little piece of detail. Those Ws here are only 32 bit wide. So, and here is how it really looks, okay? This is the same one. This is the same on, 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 on a, uh, with more details. Okay, so the message schedule. So look, and you know this is um, details. Yeah. Figure. 
11.11. Okay. So this is kind of a one level down, actually considerably level down. There are much more details in. Now, if you look on this figure, which is a more correct one here, um, what you see is the left-hand side. This is pretty much exact. This is what I showed you. What you do see here, for strange reasons, we talk about stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. That means somehow, always, instead of 80 rounds, what you do is you pack 20 rounds together. You know, the first 20 rounds are called stage one, the next 20 rounds stage two, next 20 rounds stage three, and the last 20 rounds are stage four. Four times 20 is 80, right? Is everybody with me? Right? You can check that with your calculator, so this is correct. Um, what I didn't show on, you know, on, 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 um, on, on the uh, um, hand, hand figure that we just drew by hand is this 160-bit is internally split into four words. Does, can anyone do that mentally? Kopfrechnen, 160 divided by four. But I want to know, what, what is the bit length of A here? This line, yeah, how many bits do we have? 32. Pff, okay, so this is, these all lines you see are 32-bit lines. Okay, they're words. That's actually where the name W probably stems from. This is a word. So this is word A, word B, word C, word D, and word E. The other thing that you don't see on the blackboard is how does this addition works. What you have at this point, you have this addition block. So the addition is not all. This is not really we add 160 bit with 160 bit. You add word-wise, you add 30-bit to 32-bit. And what this means here, this block, it's an adder. You know, you have two operands, A and B. 32 bit, 32 bit, you add, and normally you do an integer addition. But normally you get a carry, you get an Übertrag, right? You get, in, in, in general, you get a number with 33 bits, you drop the last bit, right? The MSB, the leading bit. So this is an addition modulo 2 to the 32. This is a mathematical, exp uh, uh, mathematical expression for this operation. What happens practically is you drop the last bit, the MSB bit. You know, bit number 33 is ignored. Fallen gelassen. So, and now we're going to discuss this. SHA-1 has colon, doppelpunkt, 4 times 20 equal to 80 rounds. Again, that's what we see over there. That means the round, they're the 80, the 80 rounds. They're grouped in, in blocks of 20. There are four stages stage and they're called t in the literature so there's the first stage is called t is as a number t equals 1 and this is consists of round Is a round counter later on. You know, this we will we need that in, in a few minutes. You know, we, we need to talk about 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 79. This is a round counter is uh, uh, indicated by the letter J. Round J equals 0 up to round 19. 
So this is the first block up there. This is, and this is not very complicated. The next stage, you know, stage number two, t, where the counter, the stage counter variable has the value, uh, uh, the stage counter variable t has the value two. So these are the rounds where j has the value 20 to 39, 39. You get the picture, right? Next stage, third stage, we're talking about rounds 40 to 59. And the fourth and last stage consists of the rounds 60 to 79. Each round has um, five times thirty two bit input plus one um, input oh thirty two input. Um, a, B, C, D, E, uppercase, Großbuchstaben, which, yeah, you know, each, each round says A, B, C, D as input, and every round has one of these W words as input, plus input W, J. Okay, so on a, on a, uh, if you want to have here a, a, a side diagram, there. you want to hear a side diagram. You can also put that underneath here, what, whatever you think helps you with understanding that here. <coughs> so if this is round J, You have five inputs, A, B, C, D, and E. That's W, J. Each of these individual inputs are words, words meaning 32-bit words. So again, this here is each of these AD babies. Okay. So um, one remark: calling this a stage, you know, this grouping of twenty rounds. You know, we have this. You see these four stages: stage one, two, three, and four. This is something I invented. They're not called stages. I mean, this grouping in, in, in 20 rounds, this is real. This is not an invention of mine. I don't know what people call them, but I was looking, when I was writing the book, I was looking for a good terminology, and I call it a stage, a stufe, phase, whatever you want to call it. Um, are people roughly with me, or was it too complicated? What, what, what are the big things we need to know now? What is the next chapter number three of the lecture? What is the, la the last thing, the actually two last things we need to know? If you want to implement that in, in Java, Java, what do you need to know? Well, okay, C. C++, okay. <laughs> Visual basic, so what, what, what do you need to know? <laughs> no, that's an insult. Um, so what do, you need, what, what do you need to know? What, what, which piece of info, which very important piece of information is missing still? Yeah. What happens as a route, right? I mean, this is still, I mean, we're getting closer and closer, but this is still somewhat high level. So we need to know inside the round. Let's write that down. Oh. 
remaining questions. Question number one is insights uh, of rounds, question mark. What is the other piece of information we do not have that you need, that you need to know if you, before you implement that in Visual Basic? Round is absolutely right. What, what, other, what other thing we don't know yet? It's on, it's on the blackboard. Yeah. Very good. How does the message schedule, you know, the um, Nachrichtenfahrplan, how does this, how does this work? In the insights of the message schedule we would like to know. which is chapter number three of today, the details of Sha1. This is the you know, drilling deeper inside, you know, bohren, going deeper. What really happens inside the round, what really happens inside the matches, message schedule. It turns out this is pretty easy. It turns out this is not that easy. But we, you know, we still have a little bit of time. Chapter number three. <coughs> Details of Sha one. And we split that in you know question answering question number one, answering question number two. And I which I rarely do, but I do it today. We call that three. 3A maybe. 3A is the round function <coughs> 20 Kästchen, okay? You need 20 little squares, 10 centimeters, 4 inches, roughly for drawing that. The more the better. If you have more, more space, the better. So, I'm going to show you now what happens inside? Right here. The input are five words A, B, C, D, E. The output is five words again, A, B, C, D. So what we want to derive at the end of this whole thing. Oh, and by the way, you don't have to copy this. You can copy that. I, I, I was going back and forth. Should I copy that or should I just use the, the boards? This is what you're going to see. I'm just copying this picture, so if you, you know, if, if, if you think it's stupid copying stuff that's in the book, which is perfectly fine for you to think, you don't have to do that. I'm just for, uh, you might have noticed I'm not a big fan of using PowerPoint or PDFs, right? I usually use a blackboard. I don't know whether you noticed that in the last you know, year of your life. So I don't want to just explain that along these lines. I like it if drawing stuff. So what, what I'm trying to say if you hate drawing, stop drawing. It's in the book. But for, for explaining that, I think it, uh, it is helpful. You go in with five words. 
you leave the function with five words. Here's what's happening. The basic idea is uh, anybody with me? Faisal Networks. Hello, hello, Ruhig. Which Cipher is which algorithm is based on Feistel networks. There was exactly one cipher that we introduced. Yes, very good. How does this look internally? Here we split in five blocks. In Feistel networks, you split in only two blocks, left and right. Then the basic idea is that you take the right-hand side put the right-hand side in some kind of function f here and you take use the output for encrypting that that's what we did in November mid-November we were talking about that stuff Similar idea here. So you, you take part of, the, part of the input, you feed that in a function, and you use it for encrypting the other one by doing an, an XOR here. So it's somewhat similar here. And that's the problem. Don't look up there. Look to me. We're taking A, B, C, D in this case, and we use that for encrypting E, very roughly speaking. And how do we encrypt? We have... Instead of an X or we use this modulo two modulo two to the thirty two addition, this funny addition. Again you don't have to copy, you can just look up. I take that away from you, okay? So you you you're forced to look, which is I'm I'm sorry for being so brutal. Uh, <clears throat> I, I want to get this analogy. I think that helps. So it helps me with understanding, so maybe it helps you. Here we took the right-hand side and the right half and fed that into the f function. We also have an f function here. And now we're taking almost all the other parts. So we use c, we use d, and we use b as inputs. This is added. This is added to E. Okay. This is what's called. In, by, by the way, this, this, is, 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 this is not. It is not, but it resembles what's called an unbalanced Feistel network. This is called a balanced Feistel network because it's split in the middle, right? It's the balanced, link and rechte Hälfte. So here, it's unbalanced because this is only 20%. This is only one fifth, right? And here. Four fifths, eighty percent are, are are not being encrypted or barely being encrypted. Um, so as you see, A is not being used for encryption. So in, uh, for not uh, as input to the F function, what you do with this is you take A and you rotate that by five positions. You know what I mean by rotate? How many bits are A? How many bits long? I'm not continuing. And it's really hard. I want to hear a number, an integer. How long? 32, very good. So we rotate that to the left hand side, right? Left hand side by five positions. So you take 32 and you shift one, two, three, four, five. Five bits are dropping and you put them here, right? Rotation, bit rotation. So, and, um, and, and, so you rotate that, and the output of the rotation is also used for encrypting E. What else do we do? 
what we did in Faisal networks. Does anyone know what the input here was, the Faisal network? What was, was the other input to the f function? The key, the subkey, exactly, ki or kj. We're not using that for the f function. We do that more directly, kind of in a simpler way, if you wish. We add our, you know, the key. It's not really the key, but the message schedule. So we use this message word, w index j. Is that right? wj yeah, at this point. And the final thing we do for encrypting e we have what's called a round constant. That means there are four constants in the algorithm. Okay, there's a round for, there's a constant for stage one. This is what's called K1. There's a K2, K3, and K4. And you add that at this point here. So, a 32 bit value K, KT. And I'm going to show you all how that works. So. This output does not become the new E. What, what, don't, don't copy. I'm doing something wrong now, right, for pedagogical purposes. Why is that a stupid idea? What is the problem with that continuing at this point? Any ideas? What will happen in the next round? You know, this will go up here again. You see here, this just, just continues. So this looks like a really good encryption of E, right? I'm adding all this junk to E, right? And this is hopefully very well encrypted. So what would happen in the next round? I would encrypt E very well again, and very well, and again, and again, and again. And not much is happening to A, B, C, and D. So what I do here in Faisal networks, do I do this here? No, right? I swap them. And we do essentially the same. So this you know, becomes word number A. And the other ones are essentially shifted by one position. So D actually. becomes word number E, but it's not quite as systematic. I do so, there's some weird things happening. C is, all, is still systematic, so I take C and I connect it to position D. Right, this is just shifted to the right, but then the um, A is also systematic. It means systematic, I mean A is shifted by one position to the right, so input A becomes output B. And the only thing that's a little, the, the only input variable that's irregular is B. What I do with B, I take B and I do a rotation this time by 32 bits to the left. By 30, 30 bits to the left or two bits to the right, by the way. Um, and this becomes then my variable C. So one thing which I omitted, and now I'll give you your, I'll give you the, the much nicer drawing back here. Can even enlarge it a little bit. Now recall, erinnern Sie sich, there's t equals 1, 2, 3, and 4, which I have some is up there. So this is. These are the different stages, the different phases and phases of the algorithm. Um, what is a little, and we already talked about this round constant, and I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. What, what is also kind of specific is this f function, which is obviously very, very important for, not obviously, but which is very, very important for um, SHA-1, 
This is not always the same, but there are four different functions, okay, depending on the stage. So what we have f index t, these are these are really four different functions. There's really functions f1, f2, f3, and f4. So in the case of block cipher, that would, for instance, me, and in block cipher, this is not being done typically, at least not in AES and DES. It would mean, for instance, in, um, that we use, let's say, in the first, I don't know, four rounds of DES, we use one F function in rounds one, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven, eight, we use a different F function. We do not do that, right? But this is what's happening here. There are some blocks that have to do that. The one that comes to mind is Serpent. There's a Serpent block cipher which we haven't done here. But what they do in, um, I think the first eight round, don't quote me, but I think the first eight round you use a certain S-box, set of S-boxes. Then in the next eight rounds you use a different S-box and then a different S-box and a different S-box. So there are four different S-boxes. This is somewhat different, uh, similar here. So in every stage, Going back to the previous slide, you know, this big picture slide here. In each stage, in each of the, in the first 20 rounds, uses one F function. The next 20 round uses another F function. This is one thing that's specific to SHA. And similarly, similar KTs are the, what's called the round constants, and again, we have four round constants. We have k1, k2, k3, and round st constant k4. We're making progress. You know, before there was this, this question of what is the input here? Let me close the door. Or is closed, yeah. It's loud. Um, so we're making progress. You know, we, we, we're still discussing this, this round function here. Showed you here, which looks pretty wild. What, is the, what do we still have to know here? What, what, what prevents you from implementing that in, in, in Java? What, what is it? The two details are missing. What are they? Well, see this and the constants, right? And, and this actually too. So, but they are given in table 11.3. Yeah. Da, da, da. Okay. Here the first are the constants. Okay. So here are the four round constants, K1, K2, K3, and K4. These are 32 bit values. Okay, so this is one hex symbol, four bits, four bits, four bits, four bits, four bits, four bits, four bits. Four bits. So these are 32 bits here. They are written in stone, you cannot choose them. Okay. What is a little bit more interesting are the f functions. f function f1, of course, has inputs b, c, d, b, c, and d. Here's what you do. These are all, they're, they're very simple. They're much simpler than the f function in Death or the, the, uh, um, the, the uh, uh, one layer in AES, what you do, this, are you familiar with these symbols here? Does anyone know what this symbol means here that are highlighted? This is um, und, right? This is and. So this is 32 bit and. This is bitwise and. This is bitwise or. This is a, can you see this little bar there? Can you see this there? You know what I'm talking about? There's a little, there's a strich over the B, right? Can you see that? Can you see that? Yeah, you can see that. Um, can you see this bar here and that I'm circling? This means B naught. This is inverted symbol, bit flipping. Okay. 
This symbol we are, you know, we know very well that's an XOR in the second function. The third function is again only Boolean AND and OR, and the third function, uh, the, uh, uh, function number four is again bitwise XOR. So what's here really happening is, from an implementation efficiency point of view, 80 rounds doesn't look good in terms of, of throughput. These are many, many rounds, right? AES has 10 rounds. This is 80 rounds. What you do in one round is very simple. This is one, two, three, four additions. Shift is not that complicated. And now the big question, what's happening inside the F function? This is here, one assembly instruction two assembly instruction, three assembly instruction, plus inversion. So it's like three or four instructions. It means you can do an entire round with something like 10 machine cycles. Very, very fast. And there's no coincidence, this was an, a, a cipher that was heavily motivated by uh, fast software. So what is now left is this question, and luckily this is um, fairly easy to explain, so we, we're, done. we're done with Q1, the insights of, round, of the rounds. Now what, what, what is left? So we, we know, we finally know what's happening inside here. What is still open, how do we do the message schedule here, meaning input 512 bits, how do we arrive 32 bits, 32 bits, 32 bits, 32 bits, 32 bits, 80 times. This is chapter 3b, message schedule. This is what I just said. So we go in with 512 bits. We want to derive W0, W1 up to W79. How do we do that? You start with XI, our input word, which is 512 bits. And you split that into uh, if you're copying, you need space here. You brauchen hier rechts noch Platz. Don't you know don't have your, your page ending here, have it ending here. So you, these are your five hundred twelve bits. You split them into words, well, this is xi here, where well, I use this somewhat complicated notation. This is input block xi and block uh, uh, word number zero. So in 32 bits, 32 bits. So who, who, who's really good with, with um, Kopfrechen, with mental arithmetic? How many words, how many 32 bits words can I fit in here? 15, right? This is 16. This is 16 times 32. So this would be block number 16 with index 15 because I start counting with zero. Now I want to derive this, this W, this message blocks here. You don't have to, you don't have to do it that long here. No. Actually, up to here is fine. In your, the, fir, the first ones are really easy. This is W0, you just copy down. 
W1 is just the next 32 bits. That means the first 16 W's are easy to compute. You don't even compute them. You just copy them over. They're easy to generate. That means W0, 1, 2, 3, up to 15 are the original message bits here. That means going back here, the first 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 15, they're easy to get. The question is, what do we do with 16, 17, 18, 19, up to 79? And there's a quite a, simil, um, a simple formula, namely... Wj, where j between 16 and 79, what you do is, it means we're talking about this here, for instance. For computing this, you go back 16 locations, so you go back 1, 2, 3, 4, up to here, so for W16, you take W0, you X all this with going back by 14 positions, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 14, that means J minus 14, you X all this with going back 8 positions, WJ minus 8, plus you go back three positions. So here you would do, you take this, x or d2 somewhere else, you take an x or, and somewhere else you take an x or. Idea. And then, then this, this shifts, right, for, the, for W17, you move all these tabs one position to the right. So this is also very fast. You know, for generating one new W word, you only need... You know, you have your old W stored, so the only thing what you do, you need one, two, three XORs. You have your new W word, which is this input, which comes into the round function. Okay. That's it for today. Thank you very much. <laughs>